Hi, welcome to the show, Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm your host, Tyler Kesky. On the show, we also have uh, James uh, Just, who is the uh, vice chair in LA County uh, Libertarian Party. And we also have uh, Lee Welter, who is the uh, who is an activist local here in Sacramento. Uh, first thing on our topic is we want to talk a little bit about the uh, Dave Chappelle show. How many of you guys saw that? Did you see it? Yeah, I, I actually, we sat down. We had a, took opportunity to watch it. Uh, I personally didn't think it was as funny as some of his other stuff, but it doesn't mean it wasn't important what he was trying to say. Well, he got a lot of criticism, and, and I, know, I know you said you didn't see it, but the, uh, a lot of the criticism he got w w was really uh, attacking the LGBTQ community and calling, referring to them as the alphabet people. And, and more importantly, I think that the main attack was on the, tran was on the transgender. It wasn't so much on, on the, uh, the gays or the lesbians, but it was the transgender people. I think that was, that, uh, was the most offended or something. By it. But I, I, yeah, I, I saw it too. It didn't really seem all that offensive. Uh, well, it seems really offensive to me, but I have a generic <laughs> view of this. Everybody has the right to be offended. Well, it, and nobody has the right to not be offended. Well, I mean, if you're watching Dave Chappelle, I, I mean, you should expect the show to be an offensive show. It's satire. It's uh, good stuff. Yeah, and that, it's, that's its in, intended uh, purpose. And, and it's funny because a lot of people were, were fans, and then all of a sudden say they were not fans because of that episode. Uh, and and I, I find it hard to believe there were ever fans because you, you, you can't be a Dave Chappelle fan and, and then got offended over that episode. Of all the other episodes he's made in the past, that's the one you cho chose the, uh, Diane Hill, Hill for. Well, it, well, what's interesting is he didn't even really attack the LGBT community or the transgender he community. He didn't at all. It, he was just talking about himself and how he didn't understand this. Now, the alphabet people, it's... It actually kind of makes sense when you get LBTQ plus 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 or whatever it is now as a bisexual man. I, it's, what is the gay community? Why do we have to, to, to you know separate ourselves from all this kind mm -hmm. of thing? It it seems counterproductive. So why can't we at least have that discussion? And now Dave Chappelle's a comedian, and so he comes out at this this kind of a, this topic with his own com comedic approach. And so it's not how I would do it, but he's a comedian. He's going to be a bit more. Rougher around the edges. And know? honestly, I, I, I'd heard the criticism before watching the episode, and I was expecting the, the jokes to go a lot further. I was actually kind of disappointed in how far the jokes didn't go. Not offensive enough, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was. You were it offended by the lack of offensiveness. I actually was. It was not as <laughs> offensive as I thought it would be. I, I'm all expecting them to make some, some joke where you get confused as a tranny with, with somebody who's not a tranny, but it, it wasn't even that. It just had something to do with, with the... Everyone riding the car and explaining what you know how how they behave and <laughs> well what we actually found the closest line that my other half found it I wouldn't know if offensive she didn't like the discussions about the the child sex pedophilia and all that kind of stuff she didn't like that she didn't like that you know she's she has her own trigger areas on those mm -hmm. things but she sat through it she watched it and then she got to the other part and you know and we kind of overall enjoyed the show you can get past the part that you don't particularly like, right? You don't have to say, the whole show is terrible because I didn't like this five-minute segment. No, I didn't like the five, seven minutes, but the rest of it was fine, right? We were uncomfortable during that five, seven minutes. We didn't like the discussion. But, you know, we watched, we watched the whole thing. We didn't flip out. We didn't say, oh, he can't do this. And, and I think it, it, part of his point that is that, because he did bring up how uh, uh, comedians are being attacked. It was an open hunting season for comedians and stuff. Uh, and how, how he brought up Kevin Hart, how he had probably had four bad tweets his entire life and, and couldn't host the Oscars because of it. Um, yeah. You know, and, and so I think he, I think he may have even known that his show would be, would get this criticism. I, I think it was almost like, almost intentional uh, without the show being actually even being that offensive. Well, he called it sticks and stones for a reason. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason he called it sticks and stones. He was deliberately going out there knowing he was going to get attacked. Now, Maybe that's his marketing strategy on this particular one, right? It, yeah, well, you got it. Was on, on the uh, was the Rotten Tomatoes? The critic reviews were, were as low as like twenty percent, but the uh, public views was ninety nine percent. He he had almost a hundred percent rating well, on the public. Figured out, didn't he? Good for him. Yeah, yeah. So the critic, well, he may have had really bad. Actually, the critic reviews was at zero percent for a while, and I think someone bumped it up to twenty percent or. 30%. Or thirteen or something. I saw it at thirteen. So yeah, so, so it bumped up slightly. Uh, but one, one critic felt sorry and maybe thought that uh, you know wasn't all bad. Uh, but but I think because almost because of that, the, all the audience, people who actually saw it, um, who aren't critics, actually liked it and got a 
almost 100% rating, probably the best ratings you can you can get. Yeah, and I didn't think it was all that. I wouldn't have rated it as good. If, I wouldn't say, well, you have to go out and watch it. No, if you're interested in, in that kind of social commentary from Dave Chappelle and, and listening to it from a comedic level, then go watch it. If you're not, then don't. It's not all that funny. But if you want to hear about his social commentary, then yeah, go, go listen to it. It's important. It's an important thing to hear. Now, whether you agree with it or not is, you know, up to you. But you should be able to, we should be able to hear, at least from a comedian's, difficult conversations. So we can actually, that's the whole point of comedy, is so you can have difficult conversations, you know, in a way that doesn't, what I'm looking for, in a way that doesn't create actually the type of social animus that we are actually trying to prevent now. In where the cancel days, culture and all that. These days kind of, of social networking, <laughs> are the critics really as influential as they were at one time? And I have yeah, an and example I, of how, how deep that goes. Uh, Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, is known as the father of public relations. He got his start when some of his associates, friends, were producing Broadway plays mm -hmm. and realized that the critics' initial response or review was very influential in the success or failure of their production. He said, give me a modest budget and I will fix that. He would invite the critics to get picked up in a limousine, taken to a really fancy restaurant, following which they would be dropped off at the theater to watch the show. And Therefore, they were in a really good mood by the time the show <laughs> came on, and it worked. It was very successful, and he went on to uh, extend his expertise. Joseph Goebbels, uh, the propagandist for uh, the Nazis, just loved Edward Bernays uh, because <laughs> it was, had some brilliant ideas. And uh, for example, look at the beer and wine industry who approached Bernays after the repeal of alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. They said, how should we go about introducing our now legal product? He said, first of all, he said, don't promote the properties, the characteristics of your beer and your wine. <laughs> Associate it with family activities, with picnics, with football games, with uh, sporting events, mm -hmm. and uh, it's worked. It has. Look at it. Oh, pretty girls, of course. You can't leave them out of the <laughs> well, I, th I think that that kind of shows how, how critics are, are useful. I mean, I was even kind of looking at the uh, re review. I think it was yesterday or today, and I was kind of thinking to myself, well, what what's the point of a critic na nowadays? I, I mean, we, I kind of trust are my peers' uh, judgment better than a critic. Like, what does a critic mean to me? Or a critic is no different than. Well, I think we have to actually think about it. Is Critics and the general public actually watch movies or TV shows for vastly different reasons. I don't watch a movie to criticize it or to a show to, to think of it from a critical position. I just watch it to enjoy it. I just watch it, right? A critic, or someone who makes their lives out, or a reviewer, they actually, they actually kind of are forced to, by their job, to watch it from, from a different perspective than the rest of us. And so they are going to end up with a different perspective. They have to watch the camera work or they have to care about the, you know, the the clothing or the, the setting or the set design yeah, and, I, and all this stuff. I, I feel like I don't, I don't care about any of that. I just watch. The, it's kind of a dead job now. I mean, I, I, what's the point of having critics now? What do you have a favorite performer like the uh, TV or Hollywood production actor, actress, that sort of thing? I don't have one. No. I do. I'd I like Dwayne Johnson. He puts a touch of humor into, in, into his uh, roles. And I don't know if that's, the director that's telling him to do it, or whether it just comes instinctively or naturally to him. But well, the kind of roles he chooses to take, he takes things that kind of that too. Plays his mm -hmm. character. Yeah, I, I, I don't watch enough movies and TVs to know anybody. I only know Kira Knightley because Christina watches the old period dramas constantly, and she's like in a thousand of those things. And so that's the only person I actually know from a celebrity. I could tell you on site who that is. Hey, I know that person. I don't know anybody else. I am not the person to ask about celebrities and stuff. I don't know anything. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> My wife's been watching some of these, um, uh, what is it, uh, coming through no Roku, uh, various 
TV series that are now available. Yeah, one, yeah, all the older. One after the other. And I, I was sort of disappointed with some of them because there's violence, killing. In fact, in one show, what was it called, The Shooter? The guy kills uh, 20 people in one short segment. Uh, and there's a, There must have been an excuse or a reason for doing that. And, and I, I don't really like violence. But on the other hand, I can see the... The, the Dwayne Johnson thing, like, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, intelligence, what was it? CIA. Yeah, yeah there was about Central, uh, Central, Intelligence. Central Intelligence. Intelligence, yes. yes. And uh, the James Bond things, there's a little twist of humor or. Um, yeah, you're, mix, dry, you're mixing it. It's a, almost like a, a sweet and sour type, type yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. actually, what I've noticed, you know, and I've, I kind of thought maybe I'm just becoming an old curmudgeon. That movies today, movies and TV shows today, are very uh, thin. There's no depth. They, they tell you exactly what they are. There's no depth. You, you watch it. There, you can't go back and you think about it later. It's almost like the art has been sucked out of it, and they just kind of tell you exactly what you're supposed to think and what you're supposed to feel. And rather back in the days, you were allowed to interpret, and you could think about it for weeks on end, and you could say, hey, you could watch it again and get a whole different take on it. Yeah, I mean that that might also be uh, the do of, of the budget of the writers and stuff. I mean, you have, yeah, some some scripts that have a lot lot more in depth probably because they spent more time on it, whereas others were like, let's make quick quick buck here. Yeah. I, really well, I play I played in a couple of below budget movies. I know there's no there's no <laughs> time or effort put into the script. They actually have. To, I was on a set on a movie once on filming, and they end up changing how one of the uh, actors dies in the movie completely. Because they didn't have time to film the scenes, so they end up. Actually, I think they. I don't even know if the actor was supposed to that. They're like, you know what? Let's just kill him and make it easy and stuff. It, it, there's <laughs> things that were like were the. If the person who wrote the script were, were to see this happening on set, they would they would go mad. <laughs> and, and the <laughs> ruining the whole thing. The director and post production makes a huge difference. Uh, as part of the uh, Access Sacramento training, we we heard years ago from somebody who had a lot of experience with uh, Hollywood movie productions. He talked about a director putting a Western movie, you know, the old shoot 'em up, mm. cowboys and whatever, and uh, he said somebody put the post production, piecing together the final product into somebody else's hands, and they they had it shown to a test audience. It was a dud. Nobody thought it was very decent at all. So they gave it back to the original director to reorganize the way he had it in his mind when, when, when they were filming it. And uh, you recognize the title, High Noon? That was it. Hmm. So he did something right. Yeah, you can butcher something in a cut, I suppose. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but butchering a lot of things, especially the way uh, Dave Chappelle's show got butchered. But <laughs> anyways, back, back to, uh, uh, since he was we were talking about the uh, I think the main thing he got attacked was the transgenderism. Well, let's talk about the uh, straight pride event. You guys hear anything about the straight pride event that happened uh, a few weeks ago? Sounds offensive to me. <laughs> it almost does. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of these things. Less it, than 100 people showed up. Yeah, it's one of these things where you're best off actually ignoring them, right? It's one of these things that, is it necessary? No. Is it goofy? Yeah. And all the people who, who are kind of setting it up kind of have their own ulterior agenda. Well, Clearly. Do you think that they're be, that they're being satirical, or do you think that that they are are offended by the LG, uh Pride events that that they are wanting to go this far? What, I, I don't. I don't think they're actually offended by the LTB Pride events. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to catch the LTB community in a in a bout of hypocrisy. They're trying to say, I want to go out there. And you sh everybody should be able to go out and express themselves sexually, and should be able to be free, be who they are. And well, if you're gonna, then okay, I'm gonna go out and express myself as a straight person, and you know, and you, well, you can't do that. Well, so you're exposing yourself as hypocrisy. I think it's just purely a, a way to have exposed the left in terms of hypocrisy, and the best way to avoid it was knock yourselves out. We're just not gonna give you any attention, and then it would have gone away. But instead, they gave it a bunch of attention, became all offended, and you essentially gave the people, the people who set it up, the exact reaction they wanted. So the opponents were their own satire, in a way. Yes, they, they essentially they, they fell into the trap that they set for them. <laughs> they, set a, they set a hypocrisy trap, and, and then the, the left fell into it. They fell into the hypocr hypocrisy trap of everybody, needs to be, everybody should be allowed to freely express themselves mm -hmm. sexually, but except for that group of people. 
<laughs> and, and so they've, they've set themselves up. And you know, I, I, don't, I haven't seen too many people coming from uh, from the left attacking it really, uh, or anybody from the LG community, community especially. I just find a lot uh, a lot of people who are probably more more center right or or, or or somewhere in there who just kind of are looking at it like, what the heck was this? Well, where did this come from? <laughs> well, again, I kind of pay attention to the, what the the reactions from the left, so. Maybe that's why it wasn't actually all that muted. It was mainly from the media. The media had the big promotion of it and saying, oh, look at these people, these, these racist, sexist, you know, they're going out to do, well, maybe they are, but the best way to have, like I said, only 100 people showed up. The best thing to do in that kind of a situation is to just ignore them. Let them go off, have their stupid party. No one's going to pay them any attention. And they're never going to do it again. That's how you actually deal with these kind of things. And rather than you actually give them power by promoting it, by you know saying these people are offensive, they're going to scare all the... You're giving them power that they don't have. So stop it. Okay, well, let's stop talking about them, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be my, that would be my suggestion, is to just ignore these guys. Because they're, they're just trying to create that hypocrisy trap, and so don't fall into it. Well, I, I, th I think one of the, uh, the kind of leads to our next subject, and one of the things that, that a lot of the people that I see, people that at least I would assume would associate with, with a, such, a, such an event, maybe not necessarily the, the people at that exact event, but uh, a lot of the things people talk about these days is the population class. You know, a lot of people, at least people on the left, tend to have this, uh, this belief that uh, we're overpopulated. Uh, but but the reality is, it, it, are, are we actually overpopulated or are we risking a, a population collapse? And this is stuff that was brought up by uh, Elon Musk and somebody else. I forget, forget who the other guy was. Um, well, there is evidence, regardless, there is evidence that as populations become more wealthy, they, they tend to have smaller families. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they can do more for their children if they only have two or three to send to college instead of 10 or 12 or 16 or whatever it may be. Yeah, and I, I think what are, what are we at, uh, at like like 2.4 uh, birth, birth rate? So for every uh, two people, we have 2.4 children, mm -hmm. um, which, which is not really a, a, a very high number. It's no, barely, that's barely that. matching yourself. Uh, and it wants you to I think get, get down to 2.2 or anything below that. Uh, it essentially becomes clear that, that uh, you're going to have a population drop. And another factor is that uh, many people are very career-oriented, and if you wait until you're well-established in your late 30s or early 40s, fertility is not what it would have been when you were <laughs> 16 or 18 or 20 years old. So you say I'm too late to have kids? <laughs> oh, no, no. You, you'll be well, I like right. to go back to, to basic genetics. When when your half your children die before they're hit, one when you're old, you have lots of kids. But when you have modern society where your children survive, you don't need to have to eight, ten kids. So you can actually have two. You can only have two kids, and you can actually be pretty, fairly certain that they're both going to make it to adulthood. But you know, in in the past, if you had five, six kids, you didn't know if any of them were going to make it to adulthood. You know, they all might die before they hit their teenage mm -hmm. years, or they all might die before they get one years old. And mm -hmm. so, as our society becomes more sanitary and we get more and we could become more access to health care and all those general life improvements, the birthing rate. Will yeah, well, but while, you, while, while your kids might be able to make it to adulthood, but it doesn't mean that they're going to make kids themselves. Yes. So well, you, you, have, you still risk uh, having your population and stuff. I mean, I mean and, and I think that's the, the issue. One of the issues that's brought up is that millennials and, 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 uh, are reproducing less and having sex less than, than uh, previous generations. Uh, and, and maybe some of you are like to point towards technology, maybe maybe that is they're all inclusive or anti-social and stuff. Uh, but millennials are, are engaging with each other or the opposite sex uh, less and less. Uh, and I do see that, that, that there is less, very less likely that, that um, you know, people are gonna be having kids. Very rarely do I see somebody who's like my age or younger having kids. Uh, it's generally, generally old, older people. Well, I do know in Denmark they've had they've had campaigns to do it for Denmark, where they're actually trying to get their people to go out and have sex because they're not having <laughs> enough they're not having enough children. But I also don't think that is there we a have, government program for that. Yes, there is literally a government program <laughs> oh, where they encur out are encouraging people to have sex. Um, but Same I think in Japan actually. Yeah, well, any of these countries that have an extremely low rate. 
But I actually don't think that overpopulation is essentially a problem or underpopulation is essentially a problem. I don't like the fear mongering on either sides. I read a study. Well, I, I mean, it's not necessarily a, a, a fear mongering thing, but rather uh, the reason why I brought one to bring it up was uh, because I think a lot of people have this fear of over, overpopulation, but the reality is the reverse is true, uh, or reverse is more likely to be true. Uh, everyone has this perception that there's overpopulation. When reality is we don't have overpopulation. We have populated cities. That is true. Mm -hmm. It is very true to have populated cities. But if you ever fly anywhere on an airplane, you <laughs> notice that there's not very many cities. So you look out the window on, a, on a, a, flying anywhere in, in, in the U U.S., uh, just look out the window. You'll find that majority of the, of the world uh, or the U.S. is just trees, uh, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not say, I, I, I grew up in Pollock Pine, so I, you know, I certainly love the wilderness and more than the trees. But, you know, it, it, you're looking out the window, you find mountains, trees, sand. Uh, a lot more more wilderness than there are cities. There are very small pockets of cities, but that's where everyone's living. At. People like to live with other people, and so that's why we have this mis misconception that, that there's plenty of room. In, in fact, if you look at the Middle East, where there's a lot of sand and the major productivity is pumping oil out of the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And you compare that with Israel, which took relatively for opportunities and created wealth out of it, uh, but agriculture and business and, but it, it takes a cultural change to make that happen. And that's one of the problems that, one of the reasons Israel is despised by so many of its neighbors because yeah, I so much envy. <laughs> they can't set a good example like that. It doesn't fit with our culture. I'm actually planning on uh, traveling in the, uh, Israel next year, earlier next year. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. I read a study that um, the population is expected to peak about 9, 10 billion, and then it's going to start declining. They're, they're expecting the population to eventually decline. It's been like 10 years. It's not yeah, actually and, all that far. And I think that that's, that's a, a very predictable rate is, is you're able to look at how much of the older generation, which still has the mindset to have more kids, is still alive producing kids, and how much of the newer generation is adopting that culture or belief that that we need to have less kids. Well, and also the poverty rate, and the worldwide poverty out, rates yeah. are decreasing. And so as poverty rates decrease, birth rates decrease. And so, it, it's again, it's that, it's that. Which is ironic if you think about it. I mean, why is it if you're poor, you have more kids? <laughs> yeah, well, it's because you've got to, it's, again, it goes back to biology. If, you know, can't that afford, can't afford uh, birth control. <laughs> well, no, we're, we're still animals. We are still fundamentally animals. And so, you know, when you're bored and you've got nothing to do, you, you, know, you, you fill your time. You it, can't it, afford or it. If, or if you're afraid that your children television. aren't going to, if you're afraid that, you know, some of your children might not make it, you have more children. It, it's a, it's or you kinda, need, you need it's more, slit, more, more workers to work on the family farm, right? More workers <laughs> to work on the family farm. It, you, you, there's, you can go back in history and look at all the various reasons it's why. My favorite uh, instances it comes from the old uh, Art Linkletter show. You're not old enough to remember that, but uh, there was a couple on uh, the show with a huge family, 14, 15, 16 children. And Linkletter asked the husband, well, to what do you attribute the size of your family? He said, it's uh, my wife's bad hearing. <laughs> my wife's bad hearing? He says, yeah, he says, at night we'd get to bed and I'd turn to my wife and ask, uh, well, do you want to get right to sleep or what? And she'll say, what? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it's all about. That's funny. Yes, we can blame a bad hearing. That's the new one. I think I'll have to try that one at home. I don't think it'll work. So. <laughs> All right. No, we have we have something more serious and deadly to talk about too. Uh, there was uh, rumors that um, a, um, a purported pedophile had involved many uh, celebrity and political figures in his web of intrigue. And uh, yes, that would be uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, yes, and something happened to that, him. He, that he couldn't guy, testify, could he? Um, couldn't to let him testify. I think he knew something about, about the Clinton. <laughs> well, he knew something about Or a maybe lot it was the Trumps, I don't know. <laughs> he knew something about a lot of people. But this is one of those things where it's perfectly normal for someone in that situation actually to want to commit suicide. If you've kind of controlled the whole, everything your whole life in an evil way, and then all the, the whole house of cards has come down on you, and you now know that you, there's no way out, and you've always kind of found a way out, it's perfectly natural for you to commit suicide to want to commit suicide, but to do it with 
two cameras not working, two guards fell asleep, um, paper sheets, and you were just taken off uh, suicide, watch. suicide watch like 48 hours before. Yeah. Something's weird. <laughs> you know, whether it's, how do you break your neck with paper sheets? I don't understand. Sounds how like you, a conspiracy theory to me, but maybe it was a conspiracy. Yeah, but you know, there's so many people that want that guy dead. It could be a, it could be in a prison, you know, somebody in the prison it, gang could have wanted to And it's dead. almost sad that he, he died too soon because uh, just imagine if, if we were able to get names from someone like him. Oh, well, they have the names. Uh, they know. Well, I think it was, there's a lot more names that they could have got out of him. So. Well, I, I think there's enough investigative uh, wherewithal that they can find everybody who's involved if they choose to. And there That's the, the question, okay. if they choose to. Yeah, and there were there, the, the victims and uh, people that worked in the organization might be willing to testify. We could be persuaded with enough. If uh, we can find a, if we can find cold case rapist from 20 years ago based upon DNA from 23 yeah. and me that someone said that you find it out, got somehow from, from, <laughs> from the, I'm, they can figure out how to find the Jeffrey Epstein, go through all the flight logs and the checks cases and his accountants and figure out all, story. do and all very that kind serious. of stuff. They can do that we, if they we choose. Have, we have one that uh, can mention uh, that's really not quite so serious. My understanding is, as a joke, somebody put up that we should raid Area 51, where supposedly an alien spacecraft crashed, and where they did autopsies of the aliens, and they have yeah, yes. Yeah, so, of that. Is that but, is that a joke or is it a serious? Yeah, that's com that's coming up on the tw on the twentieth is is the uh, day that they, that everyone was supposed to raid Area 51, and actually the uh, uh, guy who started the joke just got a visit from the FBI recently. It's going out of control. Um, but they, the, the, to clarify, uh, the, the FBI was there, was there to make sure that no one was making death threats to him, not to actually... To protect people. I like that. And, yes. and, and they, they, to protect they, him, yeah. The, the story yeah. is that if there are enough people, the military can't stop this invasion, but the military certainly can. <laughs> well, I, you know, you know as, as far as the Area 51 raid, I'm capitalizing on the event. I, I, I went to Startup re Weekend and found some people to kind of help me out, and uh, I've been working on a Ra Area 51 raid video game, coming so coming How soon. Clever, yes. Coming soon to your to your phone. You'll be able to get on your uh, Android or iPhone device. Uh, be on the App Store. You 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 can even follow, find me on Facebook uh, and Inst I think we have somebody running our Instagram page too. Uh, just Area, Area 51 raid. That's what game. I like. Entrepreneurs who can make the best of even the difficult situation. Congratulations. Why don't we raid the Fed? Instead of Area 51. No, you're talking serious now. <laughs> <laughs> we can't make a video game out of that. Come on. <laughs> All right, guys. Download my game. <laughs> Thanks for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. See you guys next week. You can also find us on, on YouTube and also on uh, Facebook. All right?